Perfect. So, hi everyone. My name is Connor Heffman, and as you may have guessed, I'm something of a wrestling fan. So this is both a great opportunity for me to share my research, but also a really cool way to connect with like-minded people and hear what under, other individuals are doing within this space. Now, I want to begin, therefore, by thanking Carolyn and her team for putting this together. So, while our American contributors may have grown up with iconic stars like Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Ric Flair, Superfly Snuka, and my own personal favorite, Kerry Von Eric, those of us in Britain and Ireland had giant, giant haystacks, Big Daddy, Big Jim Harris, Kendo Nagasaki, King Kong Kirk, and a host of other family favorites grappling for pride and prize. American wrestling's most iconic moment of the 1980s, Hogan's body slam of Andre the Giant in 1984, was nothing compared to Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks fighting it out at Wembley Arena in 1981. Put simply, British wrestling was a different world to its American cousin. Hogan may have told kids to eat their vitamins, train hard and say their prayers, but Big Daddy taught us to chant easy, easy, easy over our defeated foes. Unabashedly working class, British wrestling was equal parts soap opera and pub brawl. Our heroes were not muscled and glistening supermen, but oftentimes beer-swilling hairy men whose endurance rarely lasted beyond five minutes. British wrestling was inherently unglamorous, and that was part of its appeal. It spoke to the crowds, those watching in the arena, or those viewing it at home through ITV's World of Sport broadcast. Then my talk today speaks to that unglamorous nature of British wrestling, an element which perhaps explains its successes during the 70s and 80s, but most certainly also its downfall. Today's talk looks at one of the sport's greatest tragedies in Great Britain and its immediate aftermath. In 1987, Big Daddy, shown here, and Greg Valentine faced off in a tag team match against King Kong Kirk and King Kendo at the Hippodrome in Great Yarmouth. And although well attended, the arena was a far cry from the packed Wembley Stadium shows Big Daddy enjoyed during the 70s and 80s. Now the match was, by all accounts, an entertaining one. Over the course of 15 minutes, Daddy, Kirk, Kendo and Valentine traded barbs, heavy blows and big slams. The contest ended after Big Daddy pinned Kirk following his signature move, the Big Daddy Splashdown. As the crowd cheered, Daddy, whose real name was Shirley Crabtree Jr., came to a terrifying realization. Kirk, who was by then one of the better known wrestling personas, was no longer breathing. As pandemonium ensued, Crabtree, the promoters, and several others attempted to revive Kirk. But owing to his large size, the medical staff and attendants were unable to help him, and Kirk died en route to the hospital. Now, in the aftermath of the, context, of the contest, Daddy and the promoter Max Crowdfree were forced into a series of difficult questions, interviews, and public appearances. Although it seemed to many that Daddy had delivered the deadly blow, subsequent reports by the coroner ruled that a genetic heart problem resulted in Kirk's death. In the press, a confused narrative emerged surrounding Kirk's death and Daddy's role within it. For some, the death was emblematic of the dangerous nature of wrestling as a sport, Daddy's reckless fighting style, and the demise of British wrestling. For others, Kirk's death was a freak entertainment accident. Depending on the reporter, depending on the group, depending on the fan, Kirk's death was the result of a debilitating and poorly paid profession, or the noble death of a feared finder. For Daddy, he was forced to assert the validity of British wrestling while simultaneously expressing his condolences towards Kirk's family. Studying the aftermath of Kirk's death, the months following his passing, specifically media reports of the fight, my presentation highlights the strained nature of kayfabe, that is the deliberate nature of misrepresentation in British wrestling. As the nation came to grips with Kirk's death, the sport and its athletes struggled to draw sharp boundaries between fact and fiction, especially when it came to Kirk's opponent, Big Daddy. So it's at this point that I should probably take a few moments to introduce those unfortunate not to have grown up with British wrestling. And at this point, I'm very fortunate indeed to rely on a series of books written by John Lister, Simon Garfield, Greg Lambert, and Carrie Dunn, which have shed light on the weird and wonderful of British wrestling. Now, one work that I'm particularly indebted to is Benjamin Nifflin's recent study of British wrestling. Beginning with its origins in the late 19th century, Litherland traced the evolution of British wrestling from a once serious and competitive sport into a pseudo-sport which traversed the line between sport and theatricality. 
Now, importantly, Lithuan stressed the fact that from the first half of the 20th century, British wrestlers were forced to walk this tightrope between their on-stage personas and their private selves. Now, this is not unique, of course, to wrestling, but the personal aspect of the wrestling persona often gives a heightened sense of disreality. Now, the heyday of British wrestling, if I can call it that, came from the 60s, 70s and 80s, and pivotal in this growth was the introduction of television broadcasting in the form of ITV's World of Sport broadcast. Now, wrestling was first broadcast on the then new ITV station in 1955, and initially shown sporadically, wrestling finally achieved a regular TV slot when it became part of ITV's World of Sport program, shown every Saturday from 4 to 4.45 p.m. This is right before the football scores, so it was prime television watching. Now, introduced by the irreplaceable Ken Walton, whose footage is still found on YouTube, World of Sport roasted audiences totaling over 12 million viewers at its peak. The program brought wrestling into the homes of British and Irish viewers and helped to normalize and popularize the sport. Now this is at a time when three channels on the television was the most that you could hope for. And like their American counterparts, British wrestling was defined by heroes and villains, by now racially questionable stereotypes, and by tales of struggle and strain. Where American wrestling could be defined by muscled, glistening athletes, high-flying athletics, and at times a comic air, British wrestling's quintessential characters were larger than life men, but though possessing skill and strength, looked more like the local tough guy than the local strongman. And the focus of my talk today, Big Daddy, was emblematic of this. Shown here on the left, facing off against his once tag team partner and ultimate rival, Giant Haystacks, Big Daddy, or Shirley Crabtree Jr., came to dominate British wrestling alongside his brothers in the 70s and 80s. Employed initially as a worker in a textile factory, Crabtree spent his early life as a lifeguard, rugby league player, and coal-string guard before coming to wrestling during the 1950s. Under the guidance of Norman Morell, who wrestled for Britain in the 36 Olympics, before going on to become a promoter, Crabtree entered the sport in 1952. By the decade's end, Crabtree was a fan favourite under the moniker of Blonde Adonis Shirley Crabtree. And moving between Great Britain and Europe during this time, which would be the equivalent of an American wrestler moving between North America and Japan, Crabtree honed his craft and gained a series of titles to boot. But this did not ensure any job security. Crabtree wrestled throughout the 50s and 60s, but frustrated with the lack of permanent employment, became a sporadic and part-time wrestler. Now his star began to fade, and it was not until the mid-1970s when his brother Max Crabtree asked Shirley to come back to the ring on a permanent basis. You see, Max was beginning to make a name for himself as a promoter, and his management of Crabtree showcased his talents. Eventually, Crabtree returned under a new name, Big Daddy. And during this time in the 70s and 80s, Big Daddy was the name to beat in British wrestling. He faced off an iconic wrestling duel with wrestlers like the masked Kendo Nagasaki, who Big Daddy unmasked. He formed a tag team partnership with Giant Haystack, shown here, which totaled in excess of 50 stone in weight. And I don't know what the conversion is for our American friends. Now, Giant Haystack and Daddy split up from their tag team partnership in 77, but Daddy's star continued to rise. And it was during the late 1970s and early 1980s that Daddy's appearances at wrestling halls became sellout occasions. But more important than this, he started to push into popular society in much the same way that a Hogan or Rowdy Piper did in the US. Such was Daddy's popularity that he began appearing on children's TV shows. On the television program, This Is Your Life, he released his own music album. He published two annuals in the early 1980s. There was even a Big Daddy comic book strip published in Buster's Comics. And Daddy's fandom, those who appreciated Daddy's efforts, came from across the class spectrum in Britain, from the lowly factory worker to the Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher. Now, emblematic of Daddy's rise was his appearance at Wembley Arena, England's iconic sporting stadium, the Madison Square Garden of England, if you will. Big Daddy's matches came against the Canadian John Quinn in 1979 in front of 10,000 fans, and again against his arch rival, John Haystacks, in 1981. Now, for reasons of expediency, I haven't shown a clip of the Daddy John Haystacks match from Wembley, but I'd encourage you to look it up on YouTube because you get a sense of how these individuals could command an arena very easily. Now, importantly, Daddy won these two Wembley bouts, further solidifying his star and his fame. So 
thus far I've presented a rather positive picture of Big Daddy, which I believe is only fair given his importance to British wrestling and also the fact that I was a huge fan growing up. Now, that withstanding, his dominance was not without critique, it was not without criticism. An article by Andrew Ross, Stephen Hardy, and the previously mentioned Benjamin Lippelin stressed the damage that the Crabtree family inadvertently inflicted on British wrestling. During these decades, the 70s and 80s, the largest British promoter was Joint Promotions. Joint Promotions was run by Max Crabtree, Daddy's brother. As the three scholars indicated, it was either through nepotism or short-sightedness that Joint Promotions continually pushed individuals like Big Daddy to the detriment of up-and-coming stars. There was, many felt, something of a bottleneck at the top. Dave Soulman Bond, one of Daddy's contemporaries, later told Simon Garfield that despite Daddy's talent and success, his lumbering stature ultimately hurt the sport. Daddy was a trained wrestler and by all accounts a strong man. He was, however, not a man made for athletic gumps, long-lasting matches, or some of his contemporaries argued real panache. His success was built on and justified a wave of large, some contemporaries claimed unfit, wrestlers who were pushed ahead of smaller, younger, and more athletic talents. Now, these two critiques were to tragically coalesce toward the tail end of Daddy's career. So, Daddy wrestled well into his 60s. He only retired in 1993, but it had become clear to many that by the mid-1980s, his time in the sun was coming to an end. Certainly in 1985, ITV ended its broadcasting of wrestling, and with that, for understandable reasons, the sport moved into a downswing. This helped to explain and justify why the grandeur and glamour of Daddy's fights began to recede. The emblematic of this was that scheduled tag team match involving Big Daddy, Malcolm King Kong Kirk, shown here, King Kendo and Greg Valentine at the Hippodrome of Great Yarmouth in 1987. The match was part of a series of bouts in Daddy's feud with King Kong Kirk. Kirk, who also moonlighted as a bouncer in nightclubs, was one of the sport's most endearing characters. Highly respected by British and North American wrestlers, he fought against Bret Hart and Andre the Giant at different points in his career. Kirk was, by the 1980s, an embodiment of many of the issues then facing British wrestling. He was getting older, had come to dislike wrestling to the extent that before the tag team match against Big Daddy, he informed his wife that he had fallen completely out of love for the sport, and he was in a troubled financial situation. He couldn't refuse the payday, even though the pay for British wrestlers in the 1980s had grown very small. Now, such discontent on Kirk's part was not apparent to the audience that night, who by all accounts were treated to an eventful match. As the wrestlers moved towards the home stretch, disaster struck. Daddy finished the match with the iconic big splashdown move, which in effect was a belly flop on top of a fallen opponent. Kirk was pinned for a three count, and as Daddy celebrated, it became apparent that something was wrong. Max Crabtree later told of what happened. Mal was still on the floor. Most wrestlers after a fall would either get to their feet or roll under the bottom rope of the ring. But you could see something was wrong. Shirley tells the second I see it and runs to the ring. But of course, Mal was in the early process of dying. He was going purple. It was a circus arena and many of those people used to love the wrestling. The head of a Slavonic Polak was watching. He got in the ring and he knew what was happening too. We were trying to work the chest and the ambulance men tried. The problem was the poor man had died in the ring. He had such an enormous girth, about 25 stone, and we couldn't get him out. We had to take the ropes down, and he was announced dead on arrival at the hospital. Now, Big Daddy and Max Crabtree were immediately brought to a local police station to give evidence, but were soon deemed innocent. And a later coroner's report reiterated Daddy's innocence, claiming that Kirk had suffered a heart attack during the match. But this did little, however, to assuage public anger and public interest and public intrigue against Big Daddy. And the aftermath of Kirk's death highlighted the tensions underpinning British wrestling. As in North America and other parts of the world, wrestlers operated in that strange nexus between fiction and reality. Kayfabe, the wrestling term given to the act of deceiving the audience, lay at the heart of this tension. In general terms, kayfabe is most commonly applied to the presentation of wrestling as real rather than scripted. Now this, as you can probably guess, 
presented problems in dealing with Kirk's death? Was it the result of a cruel and grueling sport or the outcome of a script gone wrong, of an entertainment performer uh, treated poorly? Now, Daddy, in particular, was forced to navigate this rope. And in the aftermath of Kirk's death, two very clear camps began to emerge, both within the sport and within the media. Those who claimed that wrestling was a, quote, real, unscripted sport, and those who believed that it was staged and therefore endangering performers' lives. The former camp, those who maintained wrestling's integrity, was led by Daddy and his brother Max Crabtree, and indeed by the promoters joint promotions. The day after Kirk's death, Daddy wrestled another tag team match with Greg Valentine against Giant Haystacks and Mad Dog. Now, entering to a hero's welcome, although this decision was later criticised, Daddy told the audience that, as you all know, King Kong Kirk bit the dust for the last time. Like him or not, he was a tough guy. Continuing, Daddy told the audience that his belly flop splashdown, the move used on Kirk, was, quote, a legitimate tactic whose purpose was to catch my opponent off balance and come down on top of him with the entire weight of my being. Many people have said it's not for real, but none will get in the ring with me to prove it. Now, later justifying his decision to wrestle soon after Kirk's passing, Daddy claimed that I know King Kong Kirk would have gone on and he would have wanted me to go on. It's a tough business. It's a tough sport. And on that night, King Kong's Kirk's strength was phenomenal. He was as strong as any three men. Now, other less extreme proponents of wrestling stressed the hardship of the sport, claiming that matches were not pre-scripted and that each athlete took his life into their own hands whenever they entered the ring. Now, opposing such views were those obviously aware and open about wrestling's scripted nature. Now, the idea that wrestling in Britain was scripted was not a new idea. And again, Benjamin Litherland's book does a great deal of excavating these discourses. But it was still an interesting critique coming at this time. The Liverpool Echo argued that professional wrestling is rightly classified as entertainment rather than sport. This makes the death in the ring of King Kong Kirk even more of a shock. One of Daddy's former opponents, the Irishman Tony Kelly, argued that because wrestling is scripted, Daddy's actions were reckless. Kelly took umbrage with Daddy's physical size, claiming that it was unfair and unsafe for Daddy to continue to wrestle and force wrestlers to fight against him. Tony Kelly argued that wrestlers who were at a level below Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks, then still the superstars, were poorly paid and poorly treated. And again, the fact that Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks could command £100 a night for their appearance fees versus King Kong Kirk, who could command £30 or less, seemed to reiterate this fact. Now, Bernard Purcell of the Evening Herald broke down the, quote, rules of wrestling as mapped out in advance with corresponding choreography and well-rehearsed surprises. Purcell argued, and it was a common belief, it wasn't just Purcell and Kelly, that 30 pounds for Kirk's appearance was far too low and that those controlling the sport, the Crabtrees, Max and Shirley, were responsible for the wrestler's ultimate demise, but indeed were responsible for very unsafe conditions for wrestlers across the board. So within these two camps, two opposing opinions arose, and initially two opinions about Big Daddy arose. The first, the one which claimed that wrestling was a real and tough sport, depicted Kirk as a great athlete, which undoubtedly he was, who was felled by the difficulties of his sport. By framing it solely as a sport, this largely absolved Big Daddy of any blame. Those, however, who took umbrage with wrestling's scripted nature presented the Crabtrees as controlling and cynical promoters who placed wrestlers' lives at risk in order to enrich and aggrandize themselves. So depending on how one viewed wrestling, soured or colored how one viewed Big Daddy and Max Crowdfree's involvement. And it was, of course, very difficult to shake the Big Daddy persona and all this, the bastard Big Daddy persona. Some talked of Daddy's rough and ready wrestling style, arguing that maybe his skill and strength had proven too much for Kirk. Others believe that Daddy's bombastic public persona was illustrative of his private self. When Big Daddy declined attending Kirk's funeral in order to avoid overexposing, overexposing the family to even more press attention, some newspapers couched his decision in Big Daddy's feud with King Kong Kirk. Prior to the tag team match in which Kirk tragically passed away, they had been feuding for several weeks, 
And some newspapers claimed that Daddy simply couldn't let go of his anger and resentment towards Kirk, that anger that had festered during their rivalry, hence his decision not to go to the funeral. So there was, in short, a very definitive camp which couched Kirk's death in the language and storylines and characters of wrestling. But others took issue with the working conditions of British wrestlers, the crabtree monopoly over power, and the poor physical condition of aging wrestlers who are continually getting the top spots to the detriment of younger and more athletic talent. Here, Daddy, Crabtree, and Max, Max Crabtree and Joint Promotions were presented as shrewd and self-aggrandizing businessmen who, who presented a false charitable front while simultaneously exploiting their fellow performers. Now, the reality, of course, is that neither camp was entirely correct, but the struggle, the negotiation between these two opinions spoke to the continued tension between British wrestling's position in that sport entertainment nexus. So we see here then the strained nature of kayfabe, that is the deliberate nature of misrepresentation in British net wrestling. As the nation, the media and fans and other wrestlers sought to come to grips with Kirk's tragic passing, the sport struggled to draw sharp boundaries between fact and fiction and this tension was never really resolved, it just sort of petered out as the years went on. But on that note, I think I've done my fair share of talking. If you want to know any more about me or my research, please feel free to email me, tweet me, or cyberstalk me, whatever works. And I thank you for your time and your attention. Thanks again to Kerry Lynn and the Association for putting this together. I look forward to any comments, questions, and hopefully not too many criticisms they might have. Thank you.